To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. You're stuck in another one of those endless group chats trying to make a plan to meet your friends for dinner. You want sushi, but you agree to go to that new barbecue place because your friend has a crush on the bartender and you're an excellent wingman. And you know that if you don't agree to make Tuesday night work, it's gonna be like six more months before everyone's schedules match up again. And by that point, your friend will have lost the love of their life. Endless group chats aren't just the consequence of being alive these days. There's a reason it's basically impossible to make decisions with more than like four people. Whenever a group is formed, it's subject to all sorts of social and interpersonal forces that can make you do things like agree to eat ribs you don't want just to move things along. And whether it's a film crew, a fantasy football league, or the barbecue babes, we're all part of groups. And each group has ways of doing things that are socially enforced. They're likely affecting you right now. Everything from the way you dress to the hobbies you're involved with are rife with social influences. But it's not like you don't have any say. Regardless of which groups we're part of, we all have a role to play. And understanding how groups work can make us a lot more effective in those roles. Hi, I'm Deja Fitzgerald, and this is Study Hall Intro to Psychology. In our episode on social psychology and Standing Rock, we talked about group behaviors and interactions between groups. But now we'll look a little more closely at how groups can influence us as individuals and vice versa. Like, say you decide to join an improv group. At first, you have no clue what you're doing. You show up and linger outside the auditorium, unsure of where to go. Then you see a group of people heading into a practice room. So you head that way too. You can tell you're going the right way because you can just tell when it comes to improv types. This is called informational social influence. When you change your behavior to appear more correct, you followed that group because suddenly waiting outside the auditorium didn't seem like the right strategy anymore. You immediately notice a few things about the group, like they snap their fingers after every performance and every scene seems to be set in either Kansas City or Memphis. And they refer to each other as the roulettes and wear heinous matching t-shirts. You think it's all pretty odd, but you feel like you're sticking out with your regular clothes and a lack of passion for Memphis. So you, yes, and your way into becoming more like a riblet. This is an example of normative influence. When we internalize a group's norms or specific behaviors and then behave differently. Following group norms results in social rewards. Like once you start wearing the group t-shirt, they include you in the barbecue babes group chat and and their endless bacon bits. But if you don't follow the group norms, well, you might not get those rewards. Instead, the group might start finger snapping your work a little less enthusiastically, or not invite you on the Kansas City trip. And you can't help it. You want those finger snaps. So within a few months, you're a genuine riblet, an improv pig. A musical Charlotte's Web is your very favorite show ever. Your interaction with the improv group is known as conformity. You adjusted your opinions and behavior to match the group's standards. However, group norms can also be maintained through obedience. That's when you follow a more direct and explicit set of instructions from someone with authority. Like if you wore the ugly t-shirt because someone in the improv group told you that you had to or you'd be kicked out of the group. And like with everything, group influences can be both good and bad. On one hand, many social functions require normative influence to function, well, normally. Imagine a soccer team with no norm of sportsmanship or an improv troupe without having to invite all your friends to yet another show with a two drink minimum. But while being influenced to go to an improv show might sound like your personal nightmare, we don't have to think too hard to imagine how social influence can go really wrong. In one classic study in 1961, psychologist Stanley Milgram tricked regular people into supposedly harming others, demonstrating the power of obedience. Milgram was inspired by real-world events, especially the Holocaust during World War II, when designing his experiment. He wanted to understand how yielding to authority could make people agree to do horrible things. In the study, Milgram conducted a series of experiments, each with a small number of subjects and different ways of enforcing obedience. The most famous variation involved three individuals. The learner, who was a confederate, or an actor pretending to be a participant. 
the experimenter who was also a confederate, and the teacher who was the real participant. The teacher was told this was an experiment about memory. They were to give electric shocks to the learner whenever the learner made a mistake on a memory test. The teacher was supposed to increase the voltage of the shock each time. The shocks were all fake, but the learner would pretend to scream in pain whenever the teacher pushed the button for the shocks. At its most effective, Milgram reported that 65% of subjects gave the maximum voltage of shock. So conformity and obedience have a dark side, especially when group norms are unjust, prejudice, or otherwise unethical. And to be clear, Milgram's entire study was flawed and majorly unethical. That level of deception and pressure can cause real psychological harm to a participant. It wouldn't be possible with today's research standards. Groups can influence our behavior in a lot of ways. And there can be a lot of pressure and valid reasons to conform, like getting those finger snaps. But it's important to remember that we aren't just subject to the norms of our groups. Our individual abilities to act and make decisions within the group also matter sometimes a lot. Often within groups, people want to promote the group, maintain solidarity, and make sure to act in ways that strengthen the group. That's why common sections online can get so chaotic. Whether it's a political discussion or a thread on whether pineapple belongs on pizza, as the discussion continues, people often make bolder claims and wilder statements showing more extreme positions. So the entire group ends up having a much more extreme stance than it did initially, or than many individual members may have. This phenomenon is known as group polarization. So while originally the group was quietly like, yay, pineapple. By the end, individual opinions have built up and people have become braver in expressing their enthusiasm because they know they have the support of the group. So the group's vibe shifts to, pineapple is the only valid topping on pizza ever. But that's not the only way to support a group. Say you're working with a group to make the world's best pineapple pizza. You might end up with a really great crust because the dough maker performs better when other people are around. They want to prove their commitment and value to the group, so they work harder and do more to contribute, which can lead to better outcomes. In our case, pizza for the group. That's called social facilitation. But individual contributions can also have an overall negative impact on the group. So maybe the sauce isn't great because of social interference. The sauce maker performs worse when they're part of a group. And then there's social loafing. That's when a person does less work in a group environment than when they're by themselves. They can hide behind the group and their individual contributions won't be evident, so they don't work quite as hard. Unfortunately, this means your pizza doesn't have any pineapple. Unless that one person who always picks up the slack brings the pineapple, and they will because they are not going to let one loaf bring the whole group down. But you know that loaf is still going to take credit for making the world's best pineapple pizza. Another common group dynamic is called groupthink, or trying to conform with other group members, often at the cost of good decision making. So imagine a jury trying to decide if a defendant is guilty. They've heard all the evidence, looked at all the exhibits, and are now locked in a room until they can come to a group consensus. A few aspects of groupthink can show up in the scenario, like the group may have an illusion of moral correctness. Basically, everyone thinks that whatever decision the group makes is the correct one, so they're more confident about their verdict. But if most people seem to agree that the defendant is guilty, the few who aren't sure might not speak up because they're afraid of the social pushback. This is an example of self-censorship, and someone might start acting as a mind guard, a group member who filters information and funnels the group into making a certain decision. For example, they may avoid talking about any evidence that suggests the defendant is innocent, or talk over anyone who tries to mention that evidence. The desire for efficiency and consensus can lead groups to rush and ignore information or opinions that hinder their goal, so they're less likely to make good decisions. So just like groups influence our individual behavior, individual actions within the group, from social loafing to mind guarding, can also affect the overall strength and position of the group. As we've already seen, there are many, many applications for social psychology, but we're not all part of improv troops or pizza groups, so one place where many of us will see group behavior is in the workplace. In fact, there's an entire branch of psychology that examines how we behave when we're at work. It's called industrial and organizational psychology. Offices, restaurant kitchens, and construction sites all have different group norms that impact the ways employees act. There are specific ways people dress and 
talk in each of these spaces. Like, you might wear a tie to fit in at the office, but that's probably not going to be the right move if you're framing a house. And some of these norms may not be communicated explicitly. You'll eventually just pick up on the ways people talk in the office, and you too will start using phrases like, let's circle back, or we need to consider our core values. But companies might drill down on other norms. Like your boss may require you to be at your desk to touch base by 9 a.m., or you may need to wear a certain type of shoe for safety reasons. In return, you're part of the group, and you'll get your paycheck and maybe even get a raise or promotion, once your boss runs it up the flagpole and clears it with the stakeholders, of course. But your actions also contribute to the strength of the group overall. Like, loafing harms productivity while facilitation improves it. And when you spend a lot of time with a company, you might feel loyal to them and want to promote the company. You might tell your friends to eat in your restaurant per your last email or hire your construction company for their home renovations or buy the really cool product you've been working on. So that means that while we usually change our behaviors to fit in with whatever groups we're part of, we're not just victims of groupthink or subject to the strange whims of our improv. Group. Being aware of group dynamics and social influences makes it more likely we'll be able to understand how groups work and our individual roles within those groups. Because groups are powerful, and that power can be harnessed and directed in both helpful and harmful ways. So as individuals, we also have the power to resist harmful influences and use our own influence for the good of the group. If you're enjoying Study Hall, Intro to Psychology, and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to GoStudyHall.com or click on this button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.